I prepared some questions. The panelists know what they are in advance. And if we, uh, time permits, you know, I'll be looking. This is a small enough room where you can just signal me and we can get other questions from the audience. And so with those rules in mind, uh, let's engage our panelists and um, uh, hear from them. And uh, the first question I have, and then I'm going to ask Ralph to start off, and we'll just go down the line. And then I'll mix it up a little bit as we go along. That the last time PG&E filed for bankruptcy, and the four of us were all around in this business at that time in different uh, respective roles. The last time this happened, it took the better part of four, year, four years to adjudicate and have an approved plan by both the bankruptcy court and the CPUC. So I'm going to throw this question to Ralph first, as I said. Will PG&E bankruptcy two take as long, or will it take less time or longer, and maybe some of your reasons why? Go ahead, Ralph. Uh, normally, uh, at the outset of a Stanford forum, uh, one particularly particularly gratifying to be one uh, organized by my friend Jim and Susan Sweeney, uh, I try to curry favor with the audience by pointing out that I was the first male faculty spouse in the history of the Stanford Law School, which is true. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that today because uh, I think that my, uh, <laughs> my, my presence here is better uh, explained as all of us uh, experienced the first PGD bankruptcy in 2001. This one is importantly different in some respects. And I think what I want to underscore in responding to Gary's question, how long will it take, is that that's going to depend in part on the folks in this room and people like them. And we have a shared interest in trying to get pg e out of this as quickly as possible. Let me give you a couple of reasons for that. One is captured by the San Francisco Chronicle headline of this morning, which says, pg e strikes deal on fires. And it's a story, you've all heard this, the billion dollars that's desperately needed by the communities that have been devastated by wildfires. But what the article doesn't make clear, and I hope is clear in this room, is not one dime of those funds gets dispersed until pg e is out of bankruptcy. Right now, pg e doesn't have a billion dollars or any capacity uh, to act in its role uh, as a part of the solution on compensation or as its critical role as a clean energy partner for California. So that's part of the interest in getting, it out, getting out of this quickly. And one of the big obstacles to getting out of this quickly, and I'll close my opening response on this, but I think we'll be coming back to it, has to do with, Gary was kindly quoting from an article I wrote in Western Energy Institute's magazine called California's Uniquely Dysfunctional System of Wildfire Liability Rules. That came up, for those of you who were at the panel this morning uh, with Maggie and Michael, this came up. So for, if you weren't, the, the, the system we've got now is one in which California utilities own an entire wildfire and are responsible for all of the damages associated with it if their equipment contributed materially to the ignition or the spreading of the fire. And that is true regardless of fault, regardless of the reasonableness of the utility's conduct. This is called strict liability. You automatically own the entire wildfire if your equipment was involved in starting it or making it worse. No other state has that doctrine. California doesn't have that doctrine for its flood control districts. If you're in a flood control district, and you're responsible for managing water in, a, in an area of California and there's a flood, you're not automatically owning the flood. There's a determination of whether you acted reasonably, whether you were in fact negligent. Why can't we have that rule for our utilities? This is not just a PG&E issue. This is an issue for all of our utilities. But if we don't fix this, if we don't fix this dysfunctional system of automatic liability, it will be hard for any of our utilities to remain financially viable as we move into an era where wildfire risk continues to grow. There's a whole lot we can do to minimize it, to reduce it. And that's probably the most important thing for us to talk about and the mo most important lesson of the pg e bankruptcy. But as long as we stay with these uniquely dysfunctional rules, even if pg e comes out of bankruptcy now, it's at risk of slipping back at the next bad wildfire excursion, and every other utility in California, publicly owned and privately owned, faces the same risk. So when Michael Wara said to you this morning, for those of you who are in the room, and we are all grateful to him for his service on the 901 Commission, but he said, I don't think the legislature is going to do anything to change this doctrine. He needs to be wrong about that, and we need to help make sure he is. <laughs> We're going to come back to that, I hope, before our hour's up. Mike Florio. <clears throat> yes. Uh, I'm very hopeful, I wouldn't say confident, but hopeful that this bankruptcy is going to be resolved more expeditiously. And just 
why I think that's more than a naive hope is the 2001 bankruptcy was really a battle between PG&E and, and the state, particularly the Public Utilities Commission. It was characterized as an attempted regulatory jailbreak by PG&E. And that was the underlying tension, was between the state, uh, state regulators and the company. And I don't really see that in the same way here, that for the most part, PG&E and the state want the same things. They want to uh, control, eliminate wildfire risk, which is going to be a huge challenge. Uh, they want the utility to be financially viable. And importantly, they all want uh, to be able to continue to pursue the state's uh, aggressive climate goals. And all of those things are in jeopardy as long as this bankruptcy <coughs> continues. Uh, so in, in a very real sense, I think it is just about the money this time, whereas the first PG&E bankruptcy was about who's in charge. Uh, I guess you could say over 15 years or 20, PG&E has conceded that the state's in charge, for better or worse. So I think... It is going to go more quickly. I think there's a lot of pressure. Uh, I don't know that we're going to get legislation by July 12th as the uh, governor uh, would like, and I think all of us would like. Uh, we may get some legislation that then has to be changed later on because part of the complexity of this is you know, there are a number of groups within the bankruptcy proceeding that are developing their, their own plans for how to resolve it. Uh, all of those plans require some kind of legislation, and generally speaking, they require different legislation depending on which uh, version of the plan uh, ends up uh, prevailing. So it may be that the legislature can take some initial action. They'll probably have to come back and revisit that. And there is a tricky issue of coordinating between necessary legislation and necessary bankruptcy court approval. But I think the motivation is there on all sides to, to get it done. Uh, and it is just about the money. So let me just ask you to elaborate, it might be very briefly, but the other parties that you alluded to include um, uh, bondholders and shareholders. I mean, do you think they're anxious to get this done quickly? Uh, I mean, I know they want their money, get it. But yeah. in terms yeah. of all the other things you just mentioned, they don't need legislation, do they? Uh, to the extent that the, the plans would require some kind of wildfire fund or would require, say, a... a you know, the, the DWR bonds from the energy crisis are due to be paid off uh, in the next few years. And a number of the plans would essentially replace that roughly half cent a kilowatt hour bond charge with new bonds that would contribute to a wildfire fund. That would require legislation. Uh, you know, it, it, I, I think... You know, that would be, in essence, a ratepayer contribution. I think if it were a direct rate impact, the PUC would have to approve it, and the legislature doesn't trust the PUC enough to let them do pretty much anything on this without their oversight. So I think regardless of what the plan ultimately is, it's probably going to require at least PUC and probably legislative Okay. Acceptance. Doesn't sound like the speed of sound just quite no. yet. No. Uh, going to you, Frank, and you're materially involved with a client of yours in these uh, bankruptcy proceedings. So uh, what do you think? Is this going to be a, a quick shot to the bar, or are we going to get I, it I think this is a tough one. I, 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 I want to say I hope Mike Florio is correct, but I don't think he is. Oh, the odds are in uh, favor of you being... I think this is a much harder problem to solve than the 2001 bankruptcy. The 2001 bankruptcy had to do with PG&E's, and all three of the investor-owned utilities had very, very high power procurement costs 
because of the wholesale market runaway uh, mm -hmm. uh, confiscatory prices that were being charged by uh, Enron and these other operators. And so it was a finite problem. Uh, PG&E had a large lump sum of money it needed to recover. Uh, there was an elegant solution put into place, but it still took four years to do it, which was the DWR bond charge. Mm -hmm. And then PG&E and the other utilities were deputized to go out and then become the procurers of energy uh, going forward. Um, and it was, a, it was a good solution for a company that was essentially financially solvent at the time. It just had this one problem. An elephant had to be passed through the snake. The elephant was passed through in the form of the bond charge. The elephant was these excessively high power costs in the wholesale market. And there were two parts of how we solved that. And I want to take credit for one of those two parts. One part was the bond charge. We, we financed the debt, and we paid off the debt. And we were paying it. Every one of us who pays a utility bill, you're still paying it on your monthly charge. You paid it off. But the other thing we did, and it was my job as the general counsel at the Public Utilities Commission, was to pursue claims against those bad actors who who robbed California. And we, we, we got back, during my tenure at the commission, we got back $5 billion of what I used to call stolen money from these uh, aggressive wholesale uh, marketers in the wholesale market. So that was the solution we put into place, a bond charge, an aggressive litigation, and settlement of claims against the bad guys. Um, this time around, I think it's a much more difficult problem because it is liability. It, re it results from wildfires. Uh, it's a larger lump sum, for one thing. It's a much bigger number to solve. And it's a more difficult problem in the sense that uh, PG&E, notwithstanding what Ralph said about the inverse condemnation doctrine and uh, strict liability and so forth, PG&E is at fault from some of these wildfires. It appears all but certain that PG&E is not an innocent actor, is not uh, free of negligence. The PG&E was and certainly in the, it certainly appears with the campfire in paradise. PG&E's facilities are at fault. And so it's a, it's a bigger, more difficult, more morally challenging problem to solve. So I hope Mike Florio is right that we can work it through and that it somehow just becomes about the money. But it's not really. It's really, there's a moral component to this that makes it more difficult. And the sheer magnitude of the liabilities that PG&E faces makes it also much more challenging, I think, to solve. So I'd love to see it resolved. It's a serious problem for California. The insolvency and the financial, uh, uh, the hit that all the utility companies are taking from the investment community is a very, very serious challenge for California. We do need to solve this. There is an alignment of interests. I think, as Mike says, among the stakeholders. So there's reasons, perhaps, to be optimistic. Um, but it's, it, I just find this to be a very difficult uh, problem to solve, a very, very difficult problem. So I'm not as optimistic, perhaps, as Mike is, that we can do this in a short time and come up with the solution that preserves the integrity of the utility companies, takes care of the victims of the wildfires, and moves us on beyond. I just see this as a very difficult situation. OK. Follow-on comment, anyone? OK. OK. Uh, and folks in the audience, just, you know, show of hands if you have a question that you want to pose to our panelists. I'll, I'll get you in here somehow. Uh, there, at least, there has been at least one media story I have read claiming that the wildfire liability that sparked PG&E's uh, decision to seek bankruptcy protection was, quote, California's first climate change caused emergency. Do you agree with that statement? And if so, why or why not? It, uh is more complicated than that, obviously. I think we had we got in, we started to get into this this morning when Michael Warren made the point that the one climate change is increasing the likelihood of catastrophic wildfires in California. There's no question about that. There are other contributing factors. Uh, there is the rush toward the fire, the uh, the phrase that was used this morning, the land use changes that are putting more and more people at risk. Uh, there are issues in terms of how we have been constructing buildings historically and how we've been operating in electric infrastructure. And all of those together made for, re just re recall how, how both unexpected and catastrophic 2017 and 2018 were. Because the following is true. You can add up all of the damages from all the wildfires from 2000 to 2016, over 16 years, get a substantial number. In 2017, the damages for that one year alone exceed those of the previous 16 years combined. And then in 2018, the damages are bigger than 2017. The campfire of 2018 that destroyed Paradise destroyed more structures than the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. In terms of, we have had wildfires in California since time immemorial, but this level of property destruction is unprecedented. Climate change is contributing to it, 
And there are a whole host of things we need to do in response. They have to do with land use, they have to do with construction practice, they have to do with forest management. But I want to come back to and resist some. We can't get away from our, the man-made contribution to this. pg and is in bankruptcy today not because of any of those things, not even because of the magnitude of the campfire. It's in bankruptcy because the minute the campfire happened, and the minute it was clear that PG&E equipment was involved, and respectfully, Frank, nobody knows whether there was fault involved or negligence. We just don't know. And part of the reason why we don't know is there's no reason to find out under the existing legal system. It doesn't matter whether PG&E was negligent. It doesn't matter whether PG&E behaved unreasonably. We need to change. And, and now I want to spend 60 seconds explaining how both how easy this is and how bizarre the situation is. Some people act as if this doctrine were graven in stone, were part of California's, you know, back with the, with the 49ers, somehow this got into the Constitution, so we're stuck with it. Here's what the Constitution of the state of California said. This is the provision that has been screwed, construed to mean that utilities own wildfires. Private property may be taken or damaged for a public use only when just compensation is paid to the owner. Now, that provision or something like it is in every state constitution in the United States. We are the only one that has construed it to mean that investor-owned utilities have strict liability for wildfire damage, and that happened about 10 years ago by a lower court in California. It's never even been reviewed or confirmed by the Supreme Court. So the straightforward thing that the legislature could do in a piece of legislation roughly one paragraph in length is to say that California is going to follow the same rule as the rest of the country, going to apply the same doctrine as it does to flood control districts in evaluating utility liability for wildfire damage. And if we did that, it would help avoid these automatic, PG&E had really, I, I, think it's an, I think the three of us will agree on this, but let me put it out there and make sure. PG&E had no choice about declaring bankruptcy. PG&E was about to run out of money. PG&E had no access to credit or capital because the entire world knew that PG&E owned that wildfire the minute that we knew that its equipment had been involved in starting it or making it worse. And if we don't change that, we will be back in this situation however effectively we manage everything else. We're at unacceptable risk of being back in this situation again for all of our electric utilities. And if you believe that the electric systems are an important part of the clean energy transition, a point that's been made over and over again. All, the only, one thing all of the, all of the debaters agreed on in the high rail, in, in the, uh, the high-speed rail debate was the importance of electricity in moving California to a clean energy future. That is at risk because of this dysfunction, this unique dysfunction. It's easy to fix. It requires a legislature that is hearing from a diverse constituency and not just those with a proprietary interest in maintaining this uniquely dysfunctional system. And there are a lot of those people here in this room. So on my follow-up question might be, is that message being heard by folks in the legislature or their advisors, in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, right now, it's not for a couple of reasons. I mean, certainly being heard for, I, I, uh, for those of you who have been listening, you, you've been hearing it from me. <laughs> what they're not hearing it from, the most important constituency they are not hearing from is consumer advocates. And there's a great one here to my left. It is beyond understanding me. Why would consumer advocates not complain about a system that automatically loads the full weight of wildfire damage, which we know will be escalating in the future, on captive electricity users? There are a whole host of able and eloquent consumer advocates in Sacramento, and I am daring to hope that they're going to figure this out before too much. Well, longer. let's find out. Florio, what do you think? Well... Uh, just to be clear, Good time I, to bury your former colleagues. I, yeah. I absolutely <laughs> agree with Ralph that you know, this is a crazy interpretation that that needs to be fixed. I think, uh, in some ways, and and it's not just turn. It's you know, I didn't mention the, the, anybody. Yeah, I know. It's the oil companies, <laughs> it's the ag consumers. Everybody is lined up saying, this is PG&E's fault. It's not the customer's fault. PG&E should pay. Which reminds me a little bit of the posture we took during the energy crisis, which was, well, the utilities made this deal with stranded cost recovery and frozen rates, yeah. and they've got to live with it. Right. And... You know, too late, I think, I back then came to the realization that 
you know, there was a, a bigger problem than just the AB 1890 electric restructuring deal that had turned sour on the utilities that, and Frank very well summarized that. And I think that utility consumer advocates are locked in a mentality of it's us versus the utility, when here there's a much bigger problem. You know, if the cost doesn't fall on the utility in the first instance, we don't have to fight at the, over at the PUC over whether it's ratepayers or shareholders. And in fact, the money's so big it can't be either and, and survive it. So, uh, and I think, you know, what you've got on the other side are insurance companies and trial lawyers who are usually at each other's throats but are <laughs> united in this. And what I saw last summer was those folks with their publicity campaign very effectively preempt, almost capture the consumer advocate argument by saying don't bail out the utilities by changing this mm -hmm. law. When, in fact, you know, it would probably be utility customers that were bailed out to a large extent if the necessary change were made. But, mm -hmm. you know, you've got well-organized, well-funded interests that benefit from this current system. And they're the, the people who are harmed by it are diffuse and unorganized and fighting with each other. Doesn't sound too good. Now, uh, back to my original question, and I'll, yeah. if, if you wouldn't mind, um, yeah. would this, would you agree that this is California's first climate change cost emergency or not? Uh, to a large extent, I would agree. And that goes back to my time on the PUC. About two years into my tenure there, I was, I was assigned to take over the wildfire safety Proceeding, The commission has had an open proceeding on this topic ever since the San Diego fire. I was fires. going to ask, is it because of the San Diego? Yeah, and you know, it, it's been really a constant uh, series of revisions to the rules. And what, where the case was when I took it over is the commission had just imposed a new set of rules for you know, except, uh, elevated requirements were for what were called high fire threat <laughs> districts. And this was uh, after the San Diego fires, you're looking at the Santa Ana winds in Southern California. Could you specify, like, what are we talking about requirements regarding infrastructure, poles? Yeah, what, okay. yeah. In infrastructure inspections okay. and clearances, all of those kinds of things right. that are part of general order. I forget what the number. And... The, the dilemma that the commission faced was how to define the area where these heightened requirements, because they're, they're costly. I mean, it's not a free lunch. It costs a lot of money to uh, harden infrastructure. Even, I mean, the, the communications utilities are also implicated by this because they share the poles. Well, they're, they're not cost-based regulated anymore, so they don't want to spend a nickel on their share of the problem because uh, uh, it comes out of their bottom line. They can't necessarily pass it through. So it was a very contentious proceeding, and everyone said, well, okay, we should have stricter standards in high fire threat areas. What's a high fire threat area? Well, everybody kind of knows, but uh, so they took a map from Cal Fire. The Cal Fire said, this map is not useful for the purpose you're intending to use it but for. But use it anyways? The commission said, well, it's the only map we've got. <laughs> there we so go. We're There's the an answer. <laughs> and what the commission did was work with Cal Fire to commission what was essentially uh, 
uh, original scientific research looking at wind speeds, humidity, mm -hmm. precipitation, all of these factors that go into wildfire risk, is that we want to uh, hire the best experts and draw these maps that will tell us what are the places where the high fire threat exists. Now this was a long and expensive undertaking and long and expensive, are, you square it when you're talking about the PUC. But one of the things that I asked at the time was, well, we're all talking about Southern California. What about Northern California? Oh, now I was under the assumption this map covered both. Well, it, it did, but the thinking... Somebody cut it in time, half. Well, yeah. you know, it was only applied to Southern California okay. Thank in you. the first instance right. based on the map that wasn't suitable for the purpose. But the question was asked, well, what about Northern California? Okay. And the response from the gathered experts was, well, this isn't really a Northern California problem. Now, windy enough. Yeah. You it, think. The high winds in Northern California happen in the winter when it's raining. So, yeah, you get storm damage and stuff. But wildfire, that's Santa Ana winds in, in L.A. and San Diego. Well, fast forward two or three years of this research, and the results come back showing... 44% of the state is a high fire threat area. Not San Diego, Orange, and Los Angeles counties, but everywhere. And this was kind of a shock to the system. And you say, well, why? Well, you look at the mid-teens, the decade that we're just coming to the end of. We had the, what was it, four or five-year drought. That drought killed a lot of trees in the Northern California forests. If the drought didn't get them, they were weakened and the bark beetles mm -hmm. got them. And we have had a monumental die off of trees in sort of the Sierra foothills areas, mm -hmm. areas like Napa and Sonoma and on up into Humboldt, uh, places that I used to drive through 10 years ago, and all you would see were trees for as far as you could see in any direction. Now there are big patches of brown in the middle of all of that where the trees have died. That has incredibly heightened the fire risk. So I don't know that I would say it, climate change with a, with a capital C, but certainly the drought and the beetle infestation and all of these things accumulated, certainly in some part driven by climate change, we now have tens of millions of dead trees in our forest that are just sitting there waiting for a spark. Mm. Utility lines have caused fires to start with some regularity throughout history. The difference is it used to be a fire would start and it would get put out almost immediately. Didn't spread that fast. Today, there, you've got uh, an environment where the fire is going to spread naturally. You add high wind to it and you get these conflagrations that are, are not part of our historical experience, at least in Northern California. So it's... It's a very bad situation, and you know it's something that you know there just aren't easy solutions. I mean, before we even had the wine country fires, Governor Brown asked the PUC to approve uh, biomass energy con contracts, where the plants that uh, exist and have you know, come off their old uh, PERPA contracts, mm -hmm. could burn wood waste from the forests, uh, sell the electricity to the utilities, and help get rid of the problem. We approved some of those contracts, but it's really a drop in the bucket, and it's essentially too expensive mm -hmm. to harvest that wood, get it out of the forest, truck it to the plants, and burn it, 
you know, it's, it's not an economical way of producing electricity, but, you know, to his credit, you know, Governor Moonbeam saw this coming, but, you know, the response that was, was too little. To and, and I understand that the number of, uh, of bio uh, plants, I, I should call them biomass plants, has been, re been reduced or yes, re is declined. They've been dwindling the, the as uh, uh, this, this <laughs> effort kind of gave them a temporary boost, but, you know, the utilities haven't been really all that eager to contract for 10 or 12 cent power when they can get it much cheaper somewhere well, that's else. true. <laughs> that, that's an interesting question we might come to. And yeah. let me go to you, Frank. Uh, is this a climate-caused uh, emergency? In uh, I, I was just going to quickly say that I think we just heard from Commissioner Florio that he's responsible for the trouble. That well, he, I, I was a, trying to figure it's out. a failure a, of the commissioner. Oh, wait, 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 he <laughs> had the shot 10 years ago. He failed, and he, now we're living with the consequences. <laughs> but now we know he only looked at the Fortunately for him, the utilities <laughs> are strictly liable. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I think the answer is yes. I think mm -hmm. it is climate change related. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about a, a, an interview I read with uh, Pedro Pizarro, the CEO of Southern California Edison's parent company, and he said, we're, we're all, all of us, the utility companies, are just one wildfire away from insolvency. So PG&E happened to be the one that was hit this past fall, but it could happen today, tomorrow, next week for San Diego Gas and Electric or Southern California Edison. So uh, I don't think there's any denying that the, the scale of the problem, the scale of the damages that results from these periodic fires is much worse than we have seen historically. Some of that may be related to land use policies and that we're building in places we shouldn't be building and so forth. But undeniably, some of it is due to changes in the climate, the drought. Then um, let me ask you a follow-on question. Uh, also uh, speaking with Pedro, as I do often, um, suppose CAL FIRE comes out and says, uh, and I, I'll forget the name of the fire that's particularly important, it's just the letter W, but forget it. What if Edison ends up marching into bankruptcy? Give me your vision of the political landscape that ensues over the next couple months, if that happens. Frank. Uh, maybe, maybe that's the catalyst that, that causes everybody to say, okay, no, we really have to get serious about Rouse legislation, we have to get serious mm -hmm. about uh, a victim's fund and so forth. So what, uh, you're, what you're saying right there is we don't have enough of a serious situation to really make a big change? Maybe that we, uh, the this, this serious situation that we have, I wouldn't understate it, is focused on Northern California right now. The Southern California is one, file, one wildfire away from the problem, but they are not experiencing the problem right now. So the, perhaps, I'm, I'm not that tuned into Sacramento, but perhaps the political motivation to solve this would be stronger if you had yeah. a catastrophe in Southern California. Cle clearly it would. It, and the other, the other problem, if you want to call it, PG&E has managed the bankruptcy. Compared to last time, they've managed it much better this time. It's possible that Dan Richard's shift in position has something to do with it, although I wouldn't for a moment draw that. <laughs> he conclusion. won't take credit. Dan, Dan will remember that in the, at the beginning of the PG&E bankruptcy in, in 2001, one of the things that happened is the creditors basically went and tried to grab all of the clean energy investments, the Pacific Gas and Electric Company, and they were momentarily successful. All the renewable energy, all the energy efficiency, all the low-income services, all that was frozen. PG&E then went, and this is where credit is due, went in with NRDC, uh, and got those funds unfrozen relatively quickly. And the bankruptcy judge, who was the bankruptcy judge then, who is the bankruptcy judge now, this time around preemptively kept all of that going. So PG&E has not yet, there, if you ask people over the last six months, what catastrophic harm have you experienced as a result of PG&E's bankruptcy, my guess is most customers haven't noticed it. The moment where you start to notice it is when things like this happen, and there is an urgently needed settlement involving claimants who are universally sympathized with, and you suddenly realize those people can't get paid until we fix this. Mm -hmm. And there are a whole host of other people like that. There are a whole host of renewable energy contract holders who are worried about whether they're going to continue to get paid. And there is going forward the need for a mobilized, aggressively innovative electric sector that is very much at risk if we don't fix this. So I hope between PG&E uh, and between all of the other utilities in the state coming forward and saying, this is about us too, mm -hmm. we can generate that urgency, particularly if their customer groups join them in saying that. And I think they will. And now you've got some hands coming up. Okay. But Gary, can I quickly add yeah, on please, that topic? PG&E, on its first day of bankruptcy, uh, <laughs> filed a motion threatening to reject all of its power purchase, or any, any number of its power purchase agreements that it has for renewable energy and for resource adequacy. 
Uh, and that is a, it's a byproduct of this bankruptcy that really deserves to be mentioned. And I am involved in that on behalf of one of the largest renewable energy companies that's in contract with PG&E. But it's, it's one aspect of bankruptcy. In bankruptcy law, the enterprise that's reorganizing in bankruptcy has the ability to, quote, reject its executory contracts. For example, if, I'm, if I own a chain of stores, I may want to reject some of the leases that I have to close some of my stores, get rid of those lease obligations. PG&E, on its first day of bankruptcy, has threatened and has been making steps ever since then, since January, to be able to reject its power purchase agreements. And those are the agreements upon which California has built huge amounts of renewable and conventional energy sources over the past 12 to 15 years. And if they get abrogated, what will happen? And if they get abrogated, well, already, just by virtue of the threat, mm -hmm. the, the, the credit ratings of those counterparties have already been de degraded. And if they proceed with rejection, they will go into bankruptcy. The renewable energy projects will go bankrupt. The, the projects will, not the necessarily the existing assets. projects. Yeah. Well, anyway. The project it's, financed, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's a big problem for the existing people, but it's also a very big problem for our ability to build more of this kind of resource. California has very aggressive goals for increasing our level of greenhouse gas-free uh, electrical resources. And that entire initiative is a threat now because of the PG&E bankruptcy and this threat to the existing battery of power purchase agreements. It's a big aspect that deserves mention. Hold off, Dan. I want. I think Mike wants to. Add. Did you want to add something on? Uh, well, I I totally agree with Frank. I think if the contracts are rejected, they don't just disappear. They become unsecured claims right. in the bankruptcy, right? So, yes. in a sense, I'm not sure who wins in that scenario because. The problem now is PG&E. No yeah, PG&E has no has current obligations that exceed their resources. You've got these contracts that run out 15, 20 years in the future, and yes, they're above market. But if you abrogate those contracts, you bring all of that forward, and it becomes a current liability in the bankruptcy. Right. So it really makes things worse. It's less money for all the other unsecured credit. Right. I have comments, but Dan, you had a comment, and then I'm going to go to the back of the room. Yeah. Oh, you don't have to go to the back of the room. I was talking about a person with their hand up. I thought they wanted us to use the microphone. Yes. Yeah. Oh some yeah, I got in trouble for that. <laughs> yeah. Some of us, some of us follow the rules. Yeah, well. <laughs> Dan Richard. So two two things. First of all, on that last point. Um, yeah, the, any, any contracts that are rejected get thrown into the mix and they become unsecured creditors, which means politically that pg and taken payments that right now are not part of the bankruptcy because they're just pass-throughs. Mm -hmm. And they throw them into the bankruptcy proceeding competing against claims from wildfire victims, which doesn't yeah. strike me as a very smart thing to do. Yeah. So, but on the other hand, pg and may want to create headroom because they know that other costs are coming. Uh, and I think that I, I'm also following closely the issue that Frank raised, which is you already had the Topaz solar facility downgraded to junk. Clearway is a big renewable producer, has already reported that this is putting real financial pressure on them. Exelon is, yes. I think I read this in a publication Yeah, this you might have read it recently. Yeah. You might have. Um, but anyway, the main thing I wanted to say was that as we were talking here, uh, uh, somebody sent me an email that the governor just announced a wildfire uh, plant uh, like an hour ago. And I haven't fully read it because I was listening closely to what was <laughs> going on here. But apparently what he's proposed is a what will ultimately be a $24 billion fund with about half of it coming from the ratepayers through the continuation of the, uh, the current uh, ded dedicated rate component that's on the, on the bills from the last energy crisis due to roll off next year. So they do that. The other half would come from the utilities, and <clears throat> they'd have access to tap into this fund to pay off claims. Future, future claims. Yeah. Future, claims. future claims. It doesn't address, it still leaves it to PG&E to come up with the money for the 2017, 2018 wildfires. So that's still 15, 20 billion. And they only get to tap in to this new fund if they pass the PUC prudent management 
a manager standard. Right. So um, it'll be very interesting to see how Wall Street reacts to this, because I think at least from the outside, the PUC hasn't fully fleshed out that prudent manager standard. And the governor's climate advisor will be addressing this group as the final item on the agenda today, and I suspect she'll have a few things to say about this. Probably. Anyway, yeah, I just yeah. wanted Don't to point out that that was, uh, that was going on. And, uh, and after this panel of noted experts, I'll sit down and read it more closely. Yeah, and then we'll have a special panel just for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I just a uh, quick word, if I can, about the prudent, prudent standard? Um, I used to work at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. The standard there is that the utility is presumed to be prudent, and if a challenger wants to question the prudence of the utility, then the challenger bears the burden of coming forward with some evidence. In California, the rule has been the opposite until now. Uh, the Pu Public Utilities Commission rule is that the utility bears the burden in the first instance to prove that it was prudent. It's the opposite of the federal rule. And I understand, I understand from a distance here that the governor's proposal is essentially to adopt that federal rule as California's rule, where the utility would get the presumption of prudence subject to being rebutted by the challenger. It wasn't San Diego on that 378 million found prudent under the federal standard and not under the state Yes, standard. the federal government allowed yes. them to recoup Professor their- Professor Wari is shaking, is nodding his head. Yes. It's a good, good I, I illustration, a Dan, of how those two standards can be applied. Before you get up there, I, I want to make sure, I think I have a question in the back. Yes, please. Yes, please. Because if you don't, I have to yell at you. Okay. Just wanted to follow up on a couple things. Um, on the uh, FERC issue of FERC has asserted concurrent jurisdiction over the ability of the bankruptcy court to uh, reject, or pg to reject the contracts. And I think the bankruptcy judge ruled that FERC didn't have that jurisdiction, but I think they're gonna appeal it to the Ninth Circuit. So I was curious if Frank had a view on how that would play out. And then follow up question on the, uh, the PPA contracts. I think the PUC has taken the position for the power purchase contracts that the PUC would um, view as important to maintain those in, in place because of the renewable energy goals of California. And so I was curious if Mike has a view of if, the, uh, if there was a plan put forward as part of the PG&E bankruptcy that required PUC sign off, you know, how the PUC would view, view that. So those are the questions. So you want Frank to go first and then sure, um, that'd be great. Mike. Yeah. To sort of uh, it was two weeks ago today that Judge Montali in the bankruptcy court ruled that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has no role in deciding whether these contracts get rejected. The big, and that'll be subject to an appeal to the Ninth Circuit, United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Um, and I don't have a prediction except to say that's an unresolved area of the law. But the question <laughs> on a lot of our minds is, well, what about the role of the Public Utilities Commission in reviewing these? If PG&E wants to reject contracts, Remember, all of these contracts that PG&E has were approved by the Public Utilities Commission through a public process, and they were found to be just and reasonable and appropriate for co customers to pay for. Uh, is PG&E obligated to come to the Public Utilities Commission, let alone FERC, before it can move ahead with rejection of these contracts? We don't know. Um, on March the 5th, the, you, my successor, the general counsel of the Public Utilities Commission testified at a Senate hearing in Sacramento, and she said unequivocally, yes, the Public Utilities Commission would have the power, the jurisdiction to review any rejections before they could become effective. But Judge Montali's ruling two weeks ago appears to be very sweeping in its scope, and he essentially says no regulatory agency of any kind can question what I, the bankruptcy court, decide should be rejected. So. Uh, these are these are very hot questions right now uh, emanating from the bankruptcy case that PG&E filed. Yes. And not just PG&E. I mean, there, there are similar bankruptcies in other parts of the country. First Energy yes. in Ohio, yes. I think Dynagy. Uh, but it? the First Energy one is the one that was appealed to, I think, the yeah. first, sixth, fifth district. Sixth Circuit. Yeah. Sixth pending, circuit. It was just argued or will be argued this month. Yeah. yeah. Somebody else will get to the Supreme Court before PG&E does, I think. Well, I think what they'll yeah. do is they'll have both cases them. come yeah. emerge if they come mm -hmm. up with different answers. And but go yeah. ahead to the question that was posed regarding the PUC, as yeah. if you were still there. Yeah, I, I'm skeptical that the PUC has the authority to, I mean, if FERC doesn't have it, I don't see how the PUC has it. But you see, this is why you don't want your utilities in bankruptcy. Yeah. If you want your state to maintain control, if you want state authorities, state legislatures, state regulators to matter, and this, to me, 
Gary, the one point we haven't talked about at all, but I just want to make sure is yeah. on the table. This is another reason why you shouldn't automatically necessarily want the electric utility bill to be the place where all wildfire claims go. Uh, because if you're, going to be, if you're going to insist on that, if you think that's a good rule, then at, every utility is going to be one big wildfire away from bankruptcy, and that is going to cripple their ability to be clean energy partners going forward. We ought to be thinking about whether there is some sharing here that's appropriate. Florida involves the state of Florida when there's a catastrophic hurricane. There are insurance contributions that are imaginable. There are contributions from folks who are living in wildfire risk areas. The Mike Juarez Commission uh, addressed this issue at some length, and I think, Mike, I'm fairly stating the conclusion that you thought that the responsibility should be more widely shared uh, and not simply automatically default to the utilities. So, we have a question then. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Introduce uh, yourself. If you oh, don't. Jeremy Platt, uh, many years in electric power research before, re research institute before I retired. Um, I'm questioning, um, maybe Ralph did it. Uh, could you re revisit the cost number? You talked about there was a X dollars of bankruptcy cost, I guess the 2001. Uh, oh, well, so we, we were, Mike, Mike was referring well, there's two parts to, of my question. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. That was, that was that cost. Yep. And how does that compare to whatever cost you're talking about, this collection of wildfires right. now? And related to that is, is there, is there an additional tsunami of uh, punitive damages that could somehow add to these costs, or is that just not part of the story. I don't, uh, I just don't not, know. So, I, punitive, so I'm curious damages, about that. Big numbers, punitive damages are not part of this story because they're not allowed under the inverse condemnation system that Kelly, that's the only part of it I guess I could qualifiably endorse. I'm not sure I even <laughs> endorse it. I don't think we should get rid of punitive damages. But in terms of the transaction costs of a bankruptcy are ludicrously high, although they're much less than wildfire costs. I think, Mike, you estimated $400 million from the 2001 bank. That's lawyer's fees. That's insane. This is a, this is a small secular priesthood that operates at ludicrous multiples of normal rates. So what do you think the uh, bill will be this time? If you this time it'll be a lot more than $400 million, unless, unless we get it through quickly. I mean, yeah. that's another reason to get I'd it. I'd say over quickly. a billion. Total cost, but, not just legal cost. Right, but the uh, total cost of, now uh, the wildfire yeah. claims just pending against PG&E. Uh, PG&E has estimated them to be at $30 billion. Michael Wara told us this morning that a credible one-day catastrophe going forward in the Bay Area could be $35 billion within a 24-hour period. So yes, that gives you some sense. The magnitudes of liability here exceed what any individual utility could plausibly be expected to bear. And it underscores the need for what the governor has just put forward, which is some kind of a mechanism for anticipating these costs and preparing for them. The one quarrel I would have with the proposal that Dan Richards kindly read us off his cell phone is that evidently this proposal, once again, assumes that all the costs will be paid through utility bills. And I don't think that's a complete solution. Okay. Uh, so well, I would add to that, too, that there's a certain absurdity in all of it, or an element of randomness that if you're in the campfire area and the fire can be traced to a PG&E facility, all of a sudden the sky opens up and it dollars. rains money on you. Mm. If you're damaged by the Tubbs fire in Calistoga that blew all the way over to Santa Rosa, yeah. and it turns out PG&E was not, not at fault. Right. Not you know, involved. Yeah. You, you're not involved. You get nothing. Squat. I mean, you get your own insurance, but if you're uninsured. So, you know, are people who are damaged by a lightning-induced fire less worthy than those who are damaged by a utility started fire? No, but yeah. they're, they're shooting at the insulators, trust yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I want, oh, I just remembered the fire in Southern California was Woolsey fire. But uh, we're running a little bit short on time, so let me go with my third question here and let each of you um, have a chance. Let me start uh, the session here with uh, Florio and then we'll go to Frank and then uh, finish. Um, with Ralph, which is uh, give me your, your vision of um, you know, what PG&E will look like post-bankruptcy. And if you want to expand upon that and talk about all utilities in California, especially in the investor-owned utilities in California, please do so. Well, the honest answer is I don't have a clue because every idea under the sun is floating around. But let me put forward something that I think would be a constructive and politically feasible solution. Uh, 
one of the things that, you know, I think people are aware of the rapid growth of, of community choice aggregation around the state. And in the commission proceeding that was looking at the future of, P, of PG&E, I believe a number of the CCAs came in and said their future should be as a wires only utility. Just get them out of the commodity business. And San Diego Gas and Electric recently changed its historical position and said, yeah, that we agree with that. We'd like to get out of providing the electrons and we'll just be the poles and wires company. I think that you know the politicians are going to insist on some kind of pound of flesh from PG&E and you know it's as the price of whatever small b or capital b bailout happens here I think it's a great opportunity for them to pound their chests and say we got PG&E out of the commodity business. They're just going to be a poles and wires company when it may be a better corporate strategy in the long run for PG&E as well. And there's a lot of work to be done on our distribution systems. We've got uh, grid modernization that's kind of hitting pause because we have to deal with the wildfire stuff. There's a concept of a distribution system operator, kind of like the ISO is for transmission, to have uh, an entity that is focused solely on managing distribution systems and interfacing with the ISO that has not really, it, it was discussed a lot in the New York Rev, but yeah. hasn't gone that far. And, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for that as well. So I think there's a, a potential resolution here that looks to the public like, yeah, we really hammered PG&E, and really it's just putting them in a, a more forward-looking role for the future as as an aggregator of distributed resources and a manager of a two-way rather than one-way okay. grid. So, Frank, uh, your vision of the world post-bankruptcy, should we live so long? I guess I don't share the view that it's a good idea to take the utilities out of the procurement business. Hmm. The utilities are sophisticated, large, capable counterparties in dealing with the Enrons of the world, the big wholesale power sellers. You need sophistication, you need some oomph, you need to be able to hold your own. And to take that function away from, the utilities have generally done a pretty good job in that area, and to take that responsibility away from them and, just, and then disperse it among small, unsophisticated, not credit worthy community choice aggregators, with all due respect to me, that seems like a catastrophically bad idea because I have dealt with those wholesale sellers, and I know what they're like. They are really sophisticated, they are very aggressive, and very capable, and if you're not a grown-up and able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, they will clean your clock. They cleaned California's clock in 2000, 2001, and they'll do it again. And so I am, I'm a skeptic. Now, I'm, I'm offering you my point of view. I think it is reasonably likely that that is the direction we're going. It seems the utilities are quite happy to get rid of that function. Quite happy. Throw me in that briar patch. I don't want to do it. I never like doing it. I don't make any profit at it. So go ahead and turn that over to somebody else, a, a, a centralized procurement entity run by the state of California or community choice aggregators. The utilities are happy to throw us away. Um, and, and I think it's, maybe it is likely to happen, but I think it's a bad idea. I think we need, we need to keep the utilities uh, involved in that aspect of our power business in order to, uh, to do it right. Okay, Ralph, a billion and, dollar flows on right, day my, one, I, and then what happens? Well, I use the last word, part. Jan, Jan Pepper is sitting up front, uh, who's the head of Financial <laughs> Clean Energy. There is no more sophisticated. And a sponsor of this. There thing, is so no more sophisticated or adept uh, procurement. To, uh, I will stipulate uh, than, than that one. Uh, so I will dif differ with Frank, at least as to the particulars on that. <laughs> But, but look, where I want to be on this is I think the one essential thing I predict that pg e will come out as, and this is the, this is the upside, uh, is renewed in its commitment to be California's essential clean energy partner. And this is the note on which I am happy to close. 
I, uh, when I started 40 years ago at NRDC, I walked in the door, and in the sm small and cramped conference room of NRDC's small and cramped office, the entire PG&E senior leadership was gathered, and they were being deposed by aggressive NRDC lawyers. Uh, in, the, in the course of a case that went all the way on to the US Supreme Court, where NRDC won and PG&E lost, and I assumed I would spend the rest of my career gloriously defeating PG&E officers and managers. Uh, what came to pass instead is that PG&E, to I hope the gratification of everyone here and certainly to mine, uh, became the nation's largest energy efficiency investor, the nation's largest renewable energy investor, uh, the strongest proponent for climate action in the U.S. Congress, the essential force behind first Arnold Schwarzenegger and then Jerry Brown's most aggressive climate initiatives. That is the side of the company I would like remembered here after a day of fairly harsh treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the side I want to see come back stronger than ever when the bankruptcy is over. Okay. Join me in putting our hands together and thanking our panelists for coming to the